Um, hello to everyone and a very warm welcome to Dorset Humanists. We were supposed to be meeting at Mordown Community Centre today for our first live meeting since lockdown, but that's had to be put back until next month. So all being well, we'll see you at Mordown on Saturday the 14th of August for a talk by Jonathan Pierce on the resurrection of Jesus and a complimentary cream tea. And we are expecting the cream tea to appear here spontaneously and miraculously on that occasion, all being well. But before then, um, we've got a live meeting on Wednesday the 28th of July at our new evening venue, the Elstead Hotel in Niverton Road, uh, when I will be giving a talk on the life and work of Bertrand Russell. And don't forget our six mile walk tomorrow around uh, Wareham Forest. All the details are on our meetup site. Well, I'm very grateful to Julian Bergini for agreeing to do this talk at relatively short notice, uh, but of course he's able to do it from the comfort of his own home. Uh, this is Julian's third visit to Dorset Humanists, his first visit to us at Mordown Community Centre was in 2007 on the subject of complaint, why we moan about everything and whether it does any good. In 2017, he was our Darwin Day lecturer at the Bournemouth International Centre, and his topic was the philosophy of science. And today he's here to tell us about his new book on David Hume, the great philosopher of the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, so we are, just to let you know, again, we are recording this event. Um, so if you don't want to be seen on the recording, uh, especially if you're still eating your lunch, then do please turn off your video. Uh, but you can uh, turn it back on later on for the Q&A if you would like to. Okay, so um, Julian, um, very warm welcome to you. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. And I'll hand over to you to uh, share your slides and uh, on with your talk. Uh, thanks very much. Actually, I changed my mind. I'm not going to show any slides because um, I've given a talk on this book a few times and I've got all the slides for that and I thought I don't want to bore myself or sort of risk being stale and trotting out the same thing especially as you can probably find it on YouTube somewhere so I thought it's Dorset Humanists what I'll do is I'll just extemporize um, and fingers crossed that works and right. I wanted what I'd like to talk about really is why I think Hume is such a um, yeah sorry um, what I would, sorry, uh, right, I'm there, sorry, sorry, just a little distraction. So yeah, what I really want to talk about is why I think Hume is such a, a model humanist, or maybe that term model is the wrong word, but we'll, we'll see later. But anyway, why Hume is someone of such interest to humanists and, and what he should tell us about humanism today. And I think I'm gonna do that by focusing on sort of three key areas of his thought and life and those are his uh, relationship and thoughts about religion his views on the reason reason and the power thereof and also his views on ethics and morality so that seems to give us three in broad enough interesting uh, categories i said talk about hume's life and work because the, the approach of the book is to bring those uh, two things together um, in philosophy departments in universities in the English-speaking world, there is rather a tendency to teach the philosophy of anybody in a purely, as, as though the life biography history was kind of irrelevant. Uh, you attend to the arguments and uh, there's even a the thought that to bring in any facts about the biography of the writer is, is to miss the point and is a distraction and is irrelevant. But um, I don't think there's some merit to that approach, for certainly for certain aspects of philosophy. But I think when you're particularly looking at a philosophy which is supposed to inform us on how we ought to live and so forth, then knowing a little bit about the life and history, I think can be uh, quite enriching and can sort of, in a sense, provide some evidence that this is indeed a way of thinking which is conducive to a good life. Hume himself was born in the, in the early 18th century in Scotland. He was born in Edinburgh, but he spent most of his childhood in a place called Chernside, which is near the Scottish borders with England. Uh, the Nine Wells estate was the family home, and it's in a very kind of empty, secluded part of Scotland, 
It certainly would have been a very, very quiet place to live. Even now, it feels rather remote and cut off, although there is a, a, you know, a decent-sized small town uh, nearby. His family were, uh, by the standards of the time, it depends what your comparators are. Compared to most people, he was wealthy, of course. Um, but in that sort of bracket of the wealthy, the middle class, the land uh, property owners, they weren't particularly wealthy. So uh, he, he's kind of of, of 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 moderate means, but not extravagant ones. And he, he, grew, he grew up in Chernside. He went back to Edinburgh to study at university at about the age of 12, I think. I mean, at university then was a very, very different thing. And people did go very, very early. And they usually left without graduating, which is an interesting sort of fact I, I, I discovered. Uh, the reason for that was something to do with you to, to, to graduate. A payment had to go to the professor who was responsible for your graduation. And, and most people couldn't be bothered with that. They didn't have much benefit. Anyway, he didn't much like university, has to be said. And he, he, he concluded that there was uh, nothing really that to be learned from a professor that you could not learn from a book, which I think is an interesting <laughs> observation and might make you wonder why you're here uh, listening to talk and why you listen to any talks at all. Um, somewhat, somewhat exaggerating there, I think. Um, but, but I think, a fair point, a lot of formal, formal instruction isn't really telling you anything else you couldn't have got from a book. Um, now, we can talk here a little bit about religion, the role of religion in his life, because you know, as a, as a young man, he still had a religious belief, as most people would have done because they would have been brought up. That was just the time you know, to be anything other than a religious believer was very radical and could even cause you real difficulties. You know, you could be ostracized, kicked out of things, refused memberships of important organizations and so forth. And he, he was religious. And he, he didn't, he, he recalls in some letters that he didn't give up his faith easily or lightly. What he says he did was he struggled to kind of find, examine every argument he could to try to give him some reason to maintain a belief in God and Christianity, but just found that none of these arguments worked. So he felt that it was very much against his will, if you like, that he was forced to uh, give up his religious belief which i think is, is an interesting thing to observe about religious belief um there were certain varieties but or particularly of, of Christ, christians I, I don't know i don't think they form a, a majority but a sizable chunk of christians kind of believe that to to not believe in god is to reject god it's something like a willful choice that people do and it shows our arrogance it shows how, you know, uh, we, we think we're cleverer than other people, etc., etc. And I, I'm always baffled by this because it seems to me what these people don't get seems to be very easy, which is that you don't choose a belief like this. You don't choose to believe or not believe in God. You have certain experiences. You look at evidence. You look at the reason. And, you know, a conclusion, as it were, forces itself upon you. The same goes for political beliefs as well, actually. You don't just sort of choose to be left wing, right wing, whatever it might be. It's not like you can wake up one morning and say, uh, I don't know, I'm just going to have a go at a different political orientation. You have the political beliefs you do because you think about things uh, more or less thoroughly, of course, but... And it, it seems to you that one way of thinking is more correct than the other, and that is the one you therefore follow. And for Hume, this wasn't casual either. You know, the, the thing about giving up religious belief was he really, really tried to look at the arguments for it and, and found he couldn't. So he became an, an unbeliever at a fairly young age. And, you know, Hume is often held up to be a kind of a hero of humanists and, and secularists today, because a lot of his writings on religion are, are very incisive in particular uh his arguments uh, against uh, well he, first of all his counter arguments to some of the traditional arguments for the existence of god i mean these arguments come in so many different shapes and forms and subtle variations and the refutations do really but i think in in a way you only really need to know hume's approach to these things in order to to see what's what's wrong with them in particular, there's the argument, of course, that uh, there, there has to be some kind of first cause who created the universe. And that 
uh, this creator must have many of the attributes that, of God. It must be a, a God-like thing because only something like God could possibly have created um, the universe. Now, of course, these days we tend to dismiss that on the basis that, you know, combination of Darwin and the Big Bang, that we just don't need any of that kind of hypothesis anymore. The argument doesn't go away because people come back and say, yes, but what caused the Big Bang, etc., etc. And Hume's argument is really totally straightforward. And, and it, it tells you something about his broader approach to, to philosophy. He thought you can't prove anything uh, of substance about the world by pure logic alone, right? So pure logic tells you about the relationship between concepts, essentially. So if you take mathematics, you know, uh, formal logic is very much kind of uh, akin to, to mathematics. And in mathematics, you know, a mathematical proof, uh, take something simple, one plus one equals two, it has that wonderful status of, of absolute certainty. You, you can't really doubt that. And people who, who say, yes, but couldn't plus mean something else are missing the point. Given the meanings, the terms are given within mathematics. In a mathematical proof, you show that one and one equals two and many more complicated things are as well. But the point is that's only really telling you about the relationship between those numbers in an abstract sense. It's not telling you anything about what happens in the real world when you take one thing and add another thing to it. In the real world, one plus one can equal three, it can equal zero, it can equal, and this isn't, the, because in the real world, this isn't mathematics. This is just what happens when you put one thing together with another. It can lead to sort of an annihilation. It can lead to nothing at all happening. It can lead to a merging. It can lead to a multiplication. And similarly, uh, you know, uh, arguments with, with words only tell you about the meanings of words. So you know as a matter of logical necessity that if a person is a bachelor, then, it is, then that person is an unmarried man. But that's just true by definition. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything about whether a particular man is, is married or not. Um, and so he thought, you know, you can't prove anything about what causes something else purely on the basis of the meanings of terms and concepts, which actually is something that other philosophers had thought you kind of could do. Uh, it, other philosophers had argued in Spinoza, for example, you know, that the principle that every effect must have, everything must have a cause was kind of a, a necessary truth, but it isn't. It isn't a necessary truth of logic. Um, Hume says that's something that we conclude on the basis of experience. Although there's a whole lot of more complications around that because Hume's ideas of cause and effect are, are rather complicated. So there's not, it's not even, it's, so the idea, for example, that it is necessary that the universe has a cause isn't one that we can establish uh, by, by logic because um, our experience tells us that the things around us have causes, but we don't have any experience at all about origins of universes, about where these things come from. It's beyond our experience. And therefore, we can't say anything about what the cause might be. Now, even if you want, even if you do believe that nonetheless, the most reasonable explanation is that there is some kind of cause of the universe, experience still leaves us unable to say anything useful about the nature of that cause. Uh, because when we, I mean, you know, one famous arguments, very weak arguments for the existence of God, and one of those famous ones is on the analogy of the watchmaker. You know, if you just found a, a watch lying on a, on a you know, beach somewhere or something, you would conclude that there was something making it. Uh, someone had made it. And the universe is so much more intricate and complex than that. Surely you conclude the same thing. Well, Hume's point is the analogy doesn't work at all. Uh, if you find a watch, you conclude there must have been a watchmaker because in our experience, watches are things which always have a watchmaker. There is a a causal relationship there, which we have very good reasons to believe exists. Um, if we find an egg, we don't think someone made it, we think it was laid by, by an animal, because we that's the kind of cause that leads to the effect of an egg, a completely different kind of cause altogether. And if you see an interesting sort of shape in, 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 a, in a cliff edge, for example, it looks like a face, you believe that's just chance, it was caused by erosion and actually just happens to have a certain pattern. Now, Hume's point is this, what experience do we have of origins of universe? 
it's, the answer is none at all whatsoever. So there's no there's no analogy at all by which you can suggest that we have good reason to believe that the universe had an intelligent and benevolent creator. It just goes beyond the scope of our of our experience. And uh, indeed, I think you know from what we now know uh, about science, we can think that although the origins of the universe still remain somewhat hazy and, and shady, um, natural explanations are are we have the outline of natural explanations. We have no outline at all of, of non-natural ones. So he made these arguments. He also had a very famous argument against miracles, which again, isn't, isn't, a, isn't the, the argument that miracles are literally impossible. It's again, it's an evidential thing. As a matter of fact, um, every time someone reports that a miracle has occurred, the evidence in favor of it is always weaker, he said, than the evidence that miracles never occur. Because with every kind of experience, the vast majority of experience tells us that things occur as a result of natural processes and that things don't just happen external to that. And that in those rare cases where we can thoroughly examine a claim as whether something is miraculous or not, we always find that it isn't. We always find there's some kind of either delusion or forgery going on. And so the only evidence we got left that a, a, a miracle occurred is the testimony of those people who claim to have witnessed it. And without having to think of them as being wicked or misguided or anything like that, that kind of evidence is just very weak evidence compared to the whole mass of evidence which suggests miracles never occur. So there's just a couple of examples there of how Hume's thinking on religion was, was razor sharp and very critical. And for that reason, he's often held to be something of a, a hero for, for humanists. But, and I think this is where I want to say, you know, how we can learn from, from Hume about what kind of humanists to be. We certainly should admire his application of a clear sighted reason and argument to religious matters. But it is extremely telling that Hume himself was by no means a dogmatic atheist. And in fact, we have evidence that he didn't like the label of atheist at all. And this comes from a story that was told, a pretty reliable story, I believe, of him attending a dinner party in Paris. In later life, he went to Paris for a few years to actually work for the consul, consulate there as the sort of assistant to the, to the ambassador. And by that time, he was a very, very successful man of letters, to use that phrase, who was well known all over Europe. And the French, the Parisian intelligentsia just absolutely lapped him up. They loved him. He was known as Le Bon David because he was so genial, smart, clever, and all of these things. And uh, he, so he was the toast of the town. So he was invited to all sorts of things. And one of the things he was invited to was one of the famous dinners at the house of Baron Dolbach. Baron Dolbach was one of the really first avowed atheists. Yes, one of the, who wrote one of the first explicitly atheist tract in the Western world, at least. And he was very wealthy, uh, although he lived in a fairly modest house in Paris, actually. He wasn't ostentatious. Um, but he spent a lot of his money on very good food and drink, which he shared with his friends. So his dinner parties were legendary because, you know, excellent food, excellent wine. And the smartest people in France and sometimes visiting from outside of France in the room as well. So what a place to be. And at one of these parties, um, Hume said that he wasn't sure he believed in atheists because he'd never seen one. <laughs> Obviously, it's a slightly lighthearted comment. And Baron Dolbach said, well, look around the room. There are 14 of us here. Uh, Ten of us are atheists and the other four haven't made up their minds yet. Um, now, this is probably too neat a story for it to be exactly like this. But um, from other things we know about Hume and his writings and what people said of him, this re it rings true. It rings true that Hume actually sort of <sighs> the category of atheist was something that seemed a bit strange and alien to him because uh, to be an atheist, he thought, was to, to essentially assert with absolute certainty that there is no God. And that wasn't his position. His position was that we have no reason at all to believe that God exists, and we have quite a lot of reason to think that it doesn't. 
and that therefore we really should get on with our lives uh, on the basis that there is no God. That's the most sensible way to proceed. Now, in a way, that's a, that might seem to be like a tiny difference. And it kind of is a tiny difference in a way. Um, you're going to get a talk uh, next week from David on Bertrand Russell. Um, so I don't know if he's going to mention this, but Bertrand Russell once uh, made this point when he said that amongst philosophers, he should really say he's an agnostic because he cannot prove God does not exist. But that would mislead most people outside of a technical discussion because people think an agnostic is someone who goes, well, I, I don't know, maybe there's a God, maybe there isn't, you know, we should suspend judgment. And he said, that's not what I think at all. You know, I think that God's uh, existence is a possibility in the same kind of way that I think the ancient Greek God's existence is a possibility. I, you know, it's not impossible, but I've got absolutely no reason to think these things exist. And I'm going to live my life as though they don't. So in that sense, you know, Hume was, I think we can call Hume an atheist. But he's a sort of a non, non-dogmatic atheist uh, rather than a, uh, sorry, a convinced atheist rather than an absolutist uh, dogmatic one. And the reason that distinction is quite important is that, well, partly, of course, when atheists are criticised for their atheism on the basis that you cannot prove that God does not exist, it's very important. I don't think the right response to that, his response to that is, but we can prove that God doesn't exist. The right response is, but that's not what it requires to be an atheist. An atheist doesn't have to prove God doesn't exist. Uh, you know, we, we, the, the things we believe in, uh, they, we vary in our conviction according to the certainty. So again, one of Hume's famous lines is, a wise person proportions their beliefs to the evidence. So to be an atheist is to proportion your belief to the evidence, which in this case is very heavily leaning against. It's not to have absolute certainty. But secondly, just reminding it, it might seem a technical point that we're not absolutely certain, but I think in terms of how we live our lives and particularly how we interact with people who don't have, uh, who do have religious faith, a reminder of that lack of certainty and lack of absolutism is, is very important. Now, Hume, he had a reputation, he was known as the great infidel at the time. He was twice denied professorships at Scottish universities, uh, largely because of that. And at one point he was actually threatened with excommunication from Church of Scotland or something. And that could have potentially led to, to, to real problems for him. So he, had, he did have this reputation, but actually despite that, he was throughout his whole life extremely friendly and respectful of all sorts of religious people so he wrote his first book uh, his first book was actually meant to be his like magnum opus it would like you know that that would be it. it would be done the treaties of human nature he wrote it when he was pretty young and he wrote most of it in in france simply because I think the cost of living was good was cheap there and he would have peace and quiet and seclusion and he ended up in a place called la flèche which is in the Loire Valley, or it's on a tributary of the, the Loire, rather than on the Loire itself. And um, a very, very quiet place. Even today, it's not a particularly bustly, bustly place at all. At the time, it was even quieter. But uh, the reason, one reason he settled there must have been that it was the home to a Jesuit college, which had a fine library. And the Jesuits were very happy for him to use that library. And he would, and he would also often walk and talk and chat with these Jesuits, because of course, at the time, the Jesuits were some of the most educated people in the culture. And he had absolutely no problem with this whatsoever. He enjoyed it, he liked their company, they seemed to like his, and he got a lot out of it. In later life, he had many friends who were uh, religious and uh, clerics, you know, who he had corresponded with. One of them actually, at one point, it is even, possible that they were going to end up sharing uh, the same roof, living under the same house, because as they were getting older, uh, it seemed to be an arrangement that might have suited them both. It didn't happen, but it's a very, very realistic possibility. So, you know, what he sort of models here, if you like, that it is possible both to be very clear and incisive in your criticism and rejection of religion without being hostile to religion, and certainly being hostile to religious believers, and it's calibrating things according to the the reasonableness of the person that you're dealing with rather than lumping everyone together 
in the category of the religious. Because, I mean, you know, I've already given some examples of how he was very, very critical of religion. Um, he repeatedly talked about the sort of twin horrors of what he called superstition and enthusiasm. So superstition was that form of Christianity, which was most associated in his mind at the time with Roman Catholicism. Again, I should say here, I mean, to remember today that Roman Catholics are extremely uh, broad church and there's a, a very large chunk of what I like to call the ironic Roman Catholics who kind of tend to sort of like smile and sort of uh, shrug their shoulders at some of the more outlandish creeds of the Catholic Church as much as any kind of uh, humanist would. And then, of course, people who do take these things very seriously and literally, you know, and like the selling of relics and the, the blessing of holy water, all these things Hume thought was just absurd superstition and should be absolutely rejected. And enthusiasm was the opposite, the other vice, and that vice was more associated with uh, the Protestants who were very, very keen on, you know, conversion, Puritanism, stamping out anyone who didn't fit in with their view of the world. He thought that was awful too. So, you know, very clearly against established religion, against, uh, well, well, not quite against established religion. Um, curiously enough, he was in favour of the Church of England being the established church in England. He didn't want to see the church disestablished. Very surprising. Um, I think he thought it was, it was a pragmatic argument. He just thought that this kind of kept uh, Christianity kind of safe and domesticated, you know, whereas if there were no official church and it was like a, a free market of religions, what it would do is to encourage all the different Christian sects to kind of like compete with each other for believers. And that actually might whip up more religious fervor. Whereas having an established church was a way of like, you know, you know keeping it in its corner. Um, and you might say that history has shown that strategy to be, be quite a good one, because in our country of an established church, religious belief has long been in decline and, and people are remarkably indifferent to religion. The levels of indifference to re religion in the UK are, are much higher than they are, I think, in a lot of, a lot of other countries. So he may well have had a point. But what I say is against, he was critical of uh, traditional religions, critical of religious belief, and yet um, not dogmatic open to dialogue and conversation with, with religious believers. And I think that's uh, the, the right way to go and something we should sort of try and model ourselves on today as well. So I'm going to talk about three things in, in Hume and I've spent quite a long time on one. Um, so let's move on to the second and maybe I can be a bit quicker with two and three. Um, the second is his idea of reason and, and rationality. And this has got to be of great importance and interest to humanists because I think the self-image of humanists, obviously humanism is often defined uh, in contrast to religion. So that's a sort of a negative aspect of humanism, if you like. Uh, but the positive aspect, I think, is primarily reason, uh, science and reason perhaps put together in that pair. Humanists believe that they are on the side of those two things and that these two things are what give us the most reliable and accurate view of the world. And on that score, I would say that Hume was indeed an absolute humanist. But when it gets to the nitty gritty here about how powerful is reason, how powerful is science, how do these things work, people have different views. And there are somewhat, I think, uh, exaggerated or mis mistaken views of just how much kind of certainty science can give us, how much certainty reason can give us. And what I think Hume does so marvellously, and I think in this he's rather like Aristotle actually, another one of my philosophical heroes, is that he's able to fully appreciate the importance and centrality of evidence and reason-based decision-making and belief formation while at the same time having a very, very clear view of the limitations of reason. Uh, I think you've two examples which I think are really important to think about the ways in which reason is limited. So the first one, and it also relates to science, because I think that humanists would generally, almost universally perhaps say, that we should base our beliefs on the evidence. That's what really should be driving things. 
And the evidence is what we get from, from science, perhaps more than anything else, but not just science, of course, the evidence of, of history, any other evidence that we, we, we may find. So evidence-based belief formation is pretty core. And I say Hume certainly believed in that. But in order to reach conclusions on the basis of any evidence or experience at all, we have to make certain assumptions, I'll call them assumptions for the moment, about the way the world works. And the most fundamental of those is a belief in cause and effect. So, you know, every belief we have about, you know, when, when people in the sceptical or humanist community bang on about why homeopathy doesn't work and get very frustrated that it still gets state support and everything, they'll point to the evidence and they'll point to the fact that, you know, there are certain chains of cause and effect that are necessary for anything to work. And there is no, not, not only there's, is there no demonstration that homeopathy has a positive causal effect on our health, um, there is no understanding at all of what that pos possible mechanism could be that would make it work. So, you know, it's like a, a double whammy, really. Now, I mean, these arguments are very persuasive and powerful, and I'm, I'm not here to dispute them. And uh, indeed, I tend to find that every time I do use homeopathy as an example of, of something which doesn't have any evidence for it, I normally get at least uh, one uh, response. And even in, in a humanist community, I'd be very surprised if there were at least one person watching this now who has used homeopathic remedies themselves and believes they are efficacious. Um, but the point is this, that what, what is the, that, that fundamental belief in cause and effect that certain things have, that this is the way the world works, essentially. Where does that come from? And Hume's view on this is, is pretty radical, really. He says, first of all, um, you don't get it from, as I mentioned earlier, you don't get it from principle of pure reason. It's not a logical truth that everything that happens has a cause, that everything is in effect with the cause. That's not a logical truth. I mean, you, could, it's a, you can imagine a fantastical universe in which things simply happen for no reason whatsoever. You know, things happened without cause. Things just spontaneously popped into existence or not. There's no logical contradiction in, in thinking that. We don't believe that's the way our world works, but that's not because it's logically impossible for such a world to exist. It's rather what you might call physically impossible, given what we know about the way things work. But again, how do we know things work that way? It's not a principle of logic. So therefore you must say it's observation. It must be observation that tells us that things work according to principles of cause and effect. But Hume says that that's, that can't be true because we never observe cause and effect. We, we, we just simply never do. What we observe is one thing and then another thing following it, and we observe certain regularities in those things. That, those are the only things we actually observe. And that's true even if you drill down to sort of like a, a fundamental sort of, if you're being more rigorous about it in a scientific way. Yeah. So you may, when you sort of get beyond surface appearances and like you, know, you flick the light switch and the light comes on, you are ah, cause and effect. I mean, there, obviously, the, 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 we're not observing the cause and effect at all uh, because everything that's central to that mechanism happening is hidden from us. It's in the electricity, it's in the wiring. We're, so we're, we're clearly not seeing the cause and effect at work, but we believe turning the switch causes the light to come on. But even if you were to drill deeper and look at what's happening electrically, etc., all you'd actually be um, observing are regularities, that these are the things which happen, it seems, inevitably and every single time. You're, you're, you don't sort of observe causal power at work. And, and when you formulate laws of physics, you're kind of all, all, all the other sciences, what you're doing is, is you're giving sort of numbers and principles and names to those processes but fundamentally it is simply a regularity that you're observing you're not observing causal power so for Hume this was for, for reasons to, to do with his more general philosophy highly problematic that he couldn't identify any kind of perception of cause and effect which gives us the idea of cause and effect and he was forced to conclude that we get this idea not from observation but rather from the operations of the mind. The, the, the human mind has a kind of instinct, and he would have thought animal minds also have a similar kind of instinct, to when they observe certain uh, regularities, to perceive a kind of a necessary connection between them, and to, to th think of that as causation. 
So it's something that, in a sense, we project onto the world. Now, th this can get a very complex and controversial philosophical issue. I mean, in my view, it's quite clear that Hume doesn't believe that there is no cause and effect in the world and we simply project it onto it. It's rather that there is cause and effect in the world, but we don't observe it. But nature, uh, evolution, he didn't know about evolution at the time, but nature has thankfully given us that capacity to kind of um, uh, attribute that causal power, even though we don't directly observe it. So apologies if that got slightly technical, but the, the, the key take home <laughs> message is this, that even even someone who, who says, I argue on the basis of evidence and reason is at bottom uh, using a principle of cause and effect, which we believe kind of more out of instinct than out of uh, observation. And thank God we do. Thank goodness we do rather than thank God. Uh, we couldn't get on by without it. We have to believe this. And we have, <laughs> there's no better explanation of how the world works for sure. So uh, we, we, we can think it's right. But, you know, it's just but simply noticing that is a, a very kind of good way of like recognizing that we've got to be a bit modest when we talk about the power of reason and the power of observation. But it doesn't un, underneath that is something without any further foundation, something we just simply have to believe about the world. And a second aspect of the limitations of reason is it concerns morality. Um, Hume said very famously, it is not contrary to reason to prefer the scratching of my finger to the destruction of the whole world. And what he meant was this, if, 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 um, if, if I was to say to you, what would you prefer? To, what would you prefer? You know, would you prefer to scratch your finger and the whole world ends apart from you maybe, or would you prefer, um, you know, not to scratch your finger and, and for the universe to carry on existing? Obviously, we'd assume that everyone would, would, would say, oh, well, I'll not scratch my finger, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like the world to continue. But if you didn't agree with that, that wouldn't be because you were irrational, right? It wouldn't be contrary to reason to want that. It would simply be that your desires were somewhat perverse. But that doesn't make them irrational because desires are essentially, they're, they're only irrational if, your desire is linked to a kind of a means end relationship and you've made a mistake, right? So if you desire money because you think money will make you happy, your desire for money is irrational, right? But if you desire ice cream because you desire ice cream, there's, that's not rational or irrational. It's just, that's what you desire. If you desire unhappiness for some reason, then that's, again, that's not irrational. It may strike you as bizarre or perverse, but if you don't want to be happy, um, and perhaps actively want to be unhappy, that's not irrational, it's just strange. Two, two very different things. And so again, one of Hume's famous, perhaps notorious lines is that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. And it's a slightly hyperbolic phrase, I think, but what he really means there is simply that our basic motivations are not given to us by reason. Our basic motivations are given to us by uh, emotion, feeling, empathy, and instincts, you know, instincts, desires for, for happiness, for fellowship, for well-being, which are just, just things that are natural to human beings. And, you know, uh, and there's nothing logically necessary in, in those desires. There's nothing contradictory about not having them. Uh, in fact, you know, there are species where it seems uh, members of the species have no desire for their own uh, survival at all. It's just all about serving the, the colony or the hive, whatever else it might be. So in those cases, again, you've got the idea of reason is, is just kind of an instrument. So the instrument we use to try and sort of like make better decisions about the world, but our fundamental desires and motivations don't come from reason, they come from kind of instinct. So you've got our fundamental desires, and we've also got a fundamental assumption about the way the world works in cause and effect, neither of which are the products of experience or of reason. They're kind of base instincts, basic instincts. And again, why is that important to remember? Well, because actually people talk about the power of reason and the power of, the power of evidence, but it, it, it's quite humbling, as it were, to remember that if you really wanted to push 
uh, reason to its limits, you would end up with an absolute skepticism. And, you know, and Hume did think that, you know, in a sense that if you want to be absolutely rational about things, demand that you only believe things where we have a strong rational argument to believe them, then you are, the only way you're going to end up is with a Pyrrhonic scepticism named after Pyrrho, the, the French and ancient Greek skeptic, who basically advocated suspension of belief about everything. And what saves us from this Pyrrhonic scepticism is not reason or experience. It's a kind of, it's a com combination of instinct and kind of practical necessity. That's very sobering for anyone who wants to believe that reason and experience and science are our salvation. It, of course, it doesn't mean that we should dismiss reason and science. Hume uses both those things and uses evidence, but remembering that those things are not, they don't, they're, they're in a sense, they're held up almost on nothing. You know, there's nothing under which, there's nothing on which they stand, which gives a secure foundation is very sobering. And, and so also perhaps quite, quite humbling. So on the one hand, if we look at the religion aspect of it, you know, Hume gives us a way of like being very clearly, clear mindedly critical and rejecting of religion without being dogmatically anti-religious and without being hostile to religious believers. He also um, is a great demonstration of the power of reason and argument and the importance of basing our conclusions on experience, while also at the same time making us somewhat humble about um, those things and not making us sort of have an unrealistic idea about how, how great science and reason are. I did want to say a little bit about morality as a third thing. I do want to uh, save some time for, for questions. Um, when it comes to morality, I've already kind of said that Hume thinks that morality is not rooted in experience or science. And I think this is quite important because humanists, again, if you think of what, what defines humanists, one, it's that re the negative rejection of God. Two, it's the positive assertion of the power of reason and evidence. And three, it's the insistence that without God, nonetheless, one can live a good moral life. Uh, this, this this is a, a core thing and people people who think that without god anything is permitted are kind of false but hume sort of is a useful reminder here that yes good we can indeed have a morality without god but got to be honest here where does this morality come from it's not science based right it's not, science can't give us um morality well why is that because science tells us the way things are and morality is about the way things ought to be. And as Hume himself pointed out, you can't logically jump from a long list of statements about the way things are to a statement about how they ought to be. They're just a, in a different class of statement, a different kind of thing altogether. So we don't get morality from science. We don't get it from pure reason. Obviously, I think it should be clear by now that Hume thought we got nothing useful at all from just applying logic about how to live or how to understand the world. So where do we get morality from? Well, the basis of morality, according to Hume, and here he was kind of following in the footsteps of uh, Hutchison, a great Scottish philosopher. And he also had fairly similar views to Adam Smith, although there are important differences between them. But essentially the basis of morality is nothing other than a kind of a natural human sympathy which we, we the, the way he was using that word maybe is a bit closer to what we would now call empathy. But I think empathy is, again, is one of those words which has become slightly problematic. People aren't quite clear what it means. All it really means is this, is that we do have a capacity to, as it were, appreciate the emotional and hedonic and states of others, you know, that we have a feeling for them. We, 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 we appreciate that if someone is in pain, for example, we know what it's like to be in pain. We know that's not nice. We know that's not good. And we have an ability to see that's not good for other people either. And that therefore we kind of sympathize with them. And that gives us an impulse to behave in kind and altruistic ways. But importantly, it gives us a reason, but it's not a kind of a logically compelling reason. If I were to say, I know that pain is really unpleasant and bad and I don't want to have it, but I just don't care about the pain of other people. 
I'm not being illogical, I'm being a psychopath. Two different things, very, very different things. And so Hume was saying the basis of morality is actually that fellow feeling and compassion. We don't get it. We don't need a God to, to, to have it. We don't need divine eternal laws to have it, but, but nor do we get it from science. And we certainly don't get it from the application of pure reason. And again, that's, I think, is, is something that humanists should, should, should appreciate, particularly if they're going to sort of uh, exaggerate the extent to which their worldview is purely and straightforwardly a scientifically based one. Yeah. If you say I'm as a humanist, I base all my beliefs on what the science and evidence tells me, then I would say Hume would say, well, fine, but then you can't get any moral principles from that. So either you don't have any moral principles or you get them from somewhere else. If you get them somewhere else, it can't be true that science and evidence are the entire basis of your belief system. That, that can't be right. And I think one has to be honest about this. Um, for some people, people generally respond very badly to this because they think that morality must have some kind of secure foundation in order to have any authority. If, you're, if we say that morality is based in nothing other than human sympathy and empathy, then essentially it becomes sort of weak and shallow because there's no principle which tells you that you know something is 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 morally is morally wrong. And you know what do you say to someone who disagrees with you? You haven't got a logical argument against them. You haven't got an empirical argument against them. And I think some people find that quite scary. But um, I think a it's just that's the way it is. So we have to get used to it. And b rather than being scary, it in a way it's more encouraging because the fact of the matter is that people have all sorts of different views about the fundamental nature of reality, about God and religion, etc., etc. But people do tend to share those capacities of human sympathy and so forth. And so therefore, if we want a kind of shared morality in a pluralistic world, it's a good thing that the basis of the morality is something we can all kind of agree on. And that's the, um, we human flourishing is good, human suffering is terrible, and to a certain extent, um, the certainly the unnecessary suffering of other sentient creatures is also a bad thing that we shouldn't willingly uh, be, be, be part of. So, I'll, I'll, so we've got some bit of time for questions. Um, I, I will uh wrap up there. So, Hume, but with a little final thought, I think it tells us a lot about some of the three key pillars of, of humanism. Yeah rejection of religion, embrace of, of science and reason, and the belief that a positive moral life is possible. But before we sanctify St. David, um, which a, a friend of his did, actually, he had, an, in later life, he had this very interesting relationship with a woman called Nancy. Her surname has momentarily escaped me, Nancy Ord. And she was a, a very bright woman, by the sounds of things, very independent. And he loved her company. And some of the letters between them are really interesting. I mean, it seems like there is a kind of romantic attachment there, but it never really was fully blown. And, you know, Hume acknowledges in letters there's something a bit ridiculous about having this uh, romantic feelings for someone who is so much younger than him. And they, they didn't have any kind of relationship. In fact, neither of them ended up having any kind of relationship that we, we know of at all. They were both, uh, in their life single. But um, uh, when Hume moved to his new house in, um, in the new town of Edinburgh, which is where he spent the last few years of his life, Nancy Ord scrawled on the wall, uh, joking, St. David Street, she called it. And it, it's, cool, it's, it's called that now, the name, the name actually. Uh, stuck. Um, why am I talking about Nancy Ord? Ah, right, okay. Um, so <laughs> this is around kind of the idea of, uh, you know, someone being a saint. He wasn't a saint despite Nancy Ord's joke. Um, and in fact, you know, he had very, very serious failings. The most famous of which has been in the news fairly recently, his notorious footnote. In a footnote to an essay, he said words to the effect that he was apt to suspect that the Negro and indeed all the other non-white uh, species of human being, for there are many, uh, to be inferior to those of the whites. And it's a short footnote, 
it is a footnote and it begins that I am apt to suspect. So we might want to just brush it away and say this was a careless, not even a belief. He, he entertained an idea which was obviously wrong and repugnant, but, you know, let's forget about it. It's not so easy to dismiss because he revised and republished his essay several times in his lifetime. And although that footnote was tweaked a few times, it remained through all editions. So he never saw, he never saw it necessary to retract that statement. Although he also never, never thought it any reason to make it a more definite one. Never thought to say rather than I am apt to suspect something like um, it seems evidently true. Um, nevertheless, uh, it was a mistake. It was a mistake that was not inevitable in his time, James Beattie, a, a contemporary of Hume, wrote a very long diatribe against Hume, which Hume probably didn't read very carefully because the vast majority of it was a fairly weak attack on his philosophy and wasn't very good. But the passages where he criticizes um, this footnote are very, very astute. He points out that you know, there are many other societies which have indeed had great civilizations in history, and there's no reason at all to believe any superiority of, of the whites. So it wasn't impossible that someone like Hume would have seen this was wrong and had a better view. He didn't do it. That was a failing of his. It was something he did wrong. But in a way, the fact that there is that stain on him, I think for me is, is a kind of a perverse kind of blessing. <laughs> um, overall, it'd be better if it just wasn't there at all. But the fact that it is there, there is an upside to it. And the upside to it is it's a very, very poignant reminder that, you know, humanists in particular, I don't think should ever kind of sanctify anybody. Uh, we do have certain heroes in the movement, but they're all flawed. They've all got their uh, things that they get wrong. And, and that's one reason, by the way, I was always very ambivalent about this idea of Darwin Day as a kind of a, a, a national holiday. I mean, first of all, it seemed to be making this big totem out of evolutionary theory as though, you know, this was the, this was the big thing which divided the sensible from the nonsensible, which seems a little bit silly given that the theory of evolution is accepted by uh, most Christians, shall we say. But also, you know, it's Darwin Day, it's, it's elevating an individual to that level of, like it were a saint today. And I'm a bit uncomfortable with that. So the fact that Hume, despite all his great abilities and talents, despite the fact that he is in so many ways a model for us, was like everybody else, flawed. And I think, again, a, a realistic and properly intelligent and reflective humanism needs to be able to accept that about, you know, that it itself is not perfect, its members are not perfect. And although humanism has tended to take a fairly optimistic view of the possibilities of human nature that we have to acknowledge its dark side as well. The happy humanist logo um, is, is, has its benefits, but uh, it shouldn't make us sort of believe that everything about humanity is sunny and great just as long as we don't walk in the yoke with the yoke of religion. I better stop there. I've gone on far too long, um, but we've got time for questions and I don't know what time you're planning to finish, but I don't have to guillotine it at a particular time. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Julian. Um, let me just change my, my view to gallery view. Um, yes, you've given us so much to think about. It was a beautifully crafted talk. Thank you very much. And it's quite re refreshing. Um, to see you, you know, without without the, the almost the distraction of slides, so that that was great. Um, yeah, and we're getting some uh, some electronic uh, claps on the screen, which is which is mm -hmm. lovely. Um, if people know how to raise the blue electronic hand symbol, that's very handy for me to be able to see uh, or get to people in um, in turn. We can see three already, so that's great. If you don't know how to do that, if you do raise your hand, um, I'll try to try to see you um, if I can. Um, Julian, I just wanted to say uh, just a tiny little anecdote. I was giving um, a Zoom presentation to a group of uh, ten-year-old school children on Monday, and um, one of the children asked me, "You know, why is it called humanism?" and um, it's, it's so easy to, to explain, you know, that Christianity is Christianity because it's named after Christ. And it would be it would be so easy if I could just say, oh, it's called humanism because it's named after Hume. But, uh, you know, obviously, <laughs> I obviously I didn't say that. 
But um, it just occurred to me that uh, it would be so much easier because trying to explain why it's called humanism is, is actually quite difficult and complex. But anyway, there we go. Um, OK, we've got four blue hands already, so let's take them in turn. Everard was first. Everard, if you'd like to... Yeah, go ahead, Everard. What's your yep. question? Uh, Saint Everard here. Um, <laughs> uh, put your mind at rest uh, the, um, bit at the beginning where, where you said uh, you couldn't understand why... Um, I'm paraphrasing here, you can understand how people could believe things where there's no evidence and things. Well, a lot of people's minds are not like that. To them, truth is not what the evidence shows. It's what some, the proverbial fat bloke in a suit or even the real one with a booming voice states. And that is fact regardless of any evidence to the contrary. Their minds are so completely different from ours. Uh, they are what I call social animals. Uh, and, 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 and it seems to me that's why a lot of them can't do physics at school. It's nothing to do with good or bad teaching. It's just the way their brains are wired up. Uh, that's all I had really on that one. I, I enjoyed the talk. <laughs> Thanks everyone. I'm not, I'm not convinced though. I mean, you, you, you're saying that there are these people just completely different to, to us. Um, that there are these two classes of human beings, those who kind of base their beliefs on uh, what they're told by authorities and those who sort of um, work things out for themselves. I mean, it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be far less neat from that because uh, I mean, certainly I, I believe a huge number of things on what the basis of other people say. Um, not because, uh, not directly because they're wearing suits or certainly not hopefully because they're men, but because I have some reason to, to judge their, uh, to be authoritative in their fields. I couldn't, I couldn't get by without that. So we, we all um, defer to experts um, to a certain extent. Now, then the question becomes, well, the obvious reply is yes, but these people don't refer to experts at all. They refer to people who have a kind of a bogus authority. And that's what's kind of wrong. But I don't think that makes them fundamentally different from us. It means that they're making judgments about who, who classifies an authority on different grounds that, 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 that we might and in ways that we think are incorrect. And I suppose the thing that sort of just sort of troubles me a little about what you're saying, though, I think if we do start thinking that, you know, people are fundamentally different in this way and some people are just fundamentally whatever, then there are, there are two, two real problems with that. One, it, it does end up... Um, it can become then too reassuring because we're, we're the angels and they're the demons kind of thing. So it can it lead to a complacency on our part. We know how to form right beliefs, other people don't, end of story. Whereas of course, a lot of very intelligent people who are committed to the principles of evidence, reason, et cetera, et cetera, do end up believing completely wrong, completely the wrong things and sometimes things that are dangerous. So the fact that we embrace the right general approach to belief formation doesn't mean that we should be complacent that therefore we're going to end up with the right beliefs but secondly i think i think it just it, it you know sociologists were otherizing it, it makes people we disagree with too different from ourselves and i think it closes down the possibility of of any kind of intelligent discussion with them or even of changing their mind if people's brains are just wired differently then don't bother talking to them you know but i, I don't think that's the case so I, 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 I certainly, I, 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 your, your basic point that too many people accept things on the basis of authority without questioning it, and they don't set the right authorities. I entirely agree with that, but I, 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 I wouldn't, I want to resist the idea that we think of these people as being just in a different category and there's nothing they can do about it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Everard and Julie, for that. Um, let's go to Steve next. Steve. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. I just uh, wondered, Julian, I mean, I'm probably similar to you that I'm probably an agnostic rather than an atheist, but not that I believe in a, in a God as such, you know, but there's obviously much more to do with kind of history and myth and everything else as truths that can come out of that, which I'm sure you're kind of alluding to. But I just wondered if you could contrast kind of Hume's approach to, say, um, Richard Dawkins' approach. I mean, like 15 or 20 years ago when the God delusion was obviously the, the popular thing of the radical atheism. I mean, he seemed to be really targeting the fundamentalists in the religious um, communities with arguments that, to be honest, I thought I'd heard when I was 10 years old. I mean, like, he wasn't saying anything that I hadn't heard before. Um, and it seemed to be almost like shooting fish in a barrel, you know, <laughs> att attacking the, you know, the, the most fundamental religious views. 
Um, I mean, would you? Uh, Hume wouldn't have taken that approach, would he? I shouldn't have think. Yeah, no, I mean, it's very interesting because, of course, the whole social context is different and it is important to take account of these social contexts. So uh, I've been critical of a lot of the new atheist stuff um, myself in the past, but I think I've always acknowledged the fact that, uh, it, it, for example, the situation is different in the US to it was in the UK. In the UK, this just seemed to be totally disproportionate is it? because, you know, we didn't have a problem with religious fundamentalism or this kind of extreme views, you know. Um, we, we generally had a lot of like, you know, very mild, modest kind of vicars who sort of half of them were atheists themselves, in fact. Yeah. Um, but in the US, it was different. And, you know, and I can see the fact that maybe in the, U in the USA, there was more of a need to take a more aggressive stance because, yeah. you know, um, you, couldn't, you couldn't get elected to public office if you were known to be an atheist. It yeah. was that kind of bad. Um, yeah. I, did, I, did I told a story. I did an article on atheism in America several years ago for a magazine. And it still amazes me if I think about it. I met a atheist, lesbian, single mother who lived in a small town in Texas, you know, population 793 on the sign as you walk in. And, you know, of those two things, the thing, that, the only thing, one that caused her problems was atheists. Yeah. I mean, people, you know, very conservative, but they, they're okay with lesbians. They knew some people were different. They're okay with single mothers. Atheists, they thought she must be a devil worshiper or something. Um, so I can see that. And, and in lots of ways, you know, at the time, his, Hume's reputation was probably even more, um, you know, as dangerous than, 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 than Dawkins is, is was. And he was very critical. But um, so it, it's hard to tell. But I think that what you, the reason you can't imagine him taking the same approach was that, um, you know, Dawkins, oh, yeah, he, he kind of lumps all religion together uh, in the most simplistic kind of literal version and then dismisses the rest as just well obviously you know these people are fudging you know so we say well what about the person who doesn't believe these things literally he goes well they're not believing anything at all are they they're just yeah, being yeah. ridiculous you know which i think is is is, is too is too kind of a uh, dismissive and i think the thing that really that really tells is this he wrote this book called dialogues concerning natural religion which he has three three it's called a dialogue actually three people three people discussing issues of, you know, what we call natural theology about whether arguments for God existence, creation of the world, blah, blah, blah. And these three characters, the point is none of them is a caricature, right? They're non-caricatures. Non he is able to present points of view that he, he personally rejects and which other characters argue against in ways that are not straw men. They're not the kind of shooting fish in a barrel. Like you say, I mean, you know, the dialogues concerning natural religion is not shooting fish in a barrel, whereas the God delusion kind of was. Right. So I, I, th I, think, I think that tells very, very strongly, strongly for it. And again, I mean, I, I, I think that, it, oddly enough, in his per in personal dealings, I think Richard Dawkins is probably more like Hume than his reputation would suggest. He, I think he does have friends who are religious believers and he's personally yeah. very yeah. civil to them. Um, but I think I think you know there's more of a gap between his public pronouncements and and, and that than uh, there is in in Hume's in Hume's writing for sure. Okay, thank you. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, let's go to Gary. Would you like to unmute yourself, Gary. Gary Dice Pad. Yeah. That's it. Thank thank you for a um, great talk, Julian. Um, I was going to ask. Um, you jokingly said that um, Q may have been empirically correct to um, not uh, not to uh, describe himself an atheist and be uh, less ideological, perhaps, and um, a li little more accepting of religion and things like that for empirical reasons. Um, I was going to ask if that was the case today, um, or um, would, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Would it be the case today? So, for example, um, um, in our current situation, would, should we actually be more uh, sort of allowing of religion and things like that? Not allowing of religion, but encouraging of it, um, because it might be, um, in pr um, practically speaking, doing good, even if we find it uh, some, somewhat... Um, rationally and empirically uh, sort of lacking. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I mean, a couple of things to sort of 
tease out a few different things there. I think I think his reasons for saying he wasn't an atheist weren't really empirical reasons, except to the extent that it was reflecting how those terms would have been understood, perhaps, uh, and how they were actually used in a way that I, th I think today, the way we use the terms atheist and agnostic, atheist would be the, the more accurate description. And, and, and by the way, I, I call myself an atheist. I don't call myself an agnostic. I am an atheist, just I say non-dogmatic atheist. Um, the, the thing about the empirical evidence is right, I think I was mentioning around the disestablishment of the church um, and how he thought for empirical reasons that wasn't a good idea. But what you're asking is something else, which did, did you have the belief that somehow because religion does a certain amount of good in the world, it would be better to kind of encourage it than it would not to. I, I don't think, I mean, yeah. I don't think there is any evidence that he, he, he did believe that, to be honest. I, yeah, he certainly didn't think there was, religion was, was such a menace that it was necessary to kind of crush every trace of it. <laughs> um, so, that, so that might be, and empirically he knew good people, but he, 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 he did say, it was one of his deathbed things, I think Adam Smith reported, um, actually reported it slightly differently to two different people, but apparently Hume had said that, you know, if he had any regrets that he had not lived to see, as it were, the, the end of the superstition and enthusiasm in, in the world kind of thing. Yeah. He definitely wanted to see an end to, to those forms of, of religion and thought that would be a, a good thing. And I, 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 but I guess we just don't really know whether or not he thought that um, it would be better if there was some vestige of religion uh, left in, in the world. But we've got no reason to think he, he did either. So I think it's a little bit of a mystery, to be honest. And I think, I think in general, I've got to say that, if you, just for the sake of having an opinion, expressing a personal opinion on this, I, I think it's rather takes rather a dim view of, of humanity to think that we're always going to need religion in order to kind of like, you know, keep, keep the weak minded in, in line kind of thing. I, I hope it's not quite like that. But I think that to be too, too much of a hurry to rid the world of religion would be, would be deeply um, problematic. And that rather like him, I think that, you know, we should be addressing the most problematic forms of religion and we just don't have to worry about the rest. We'll say, we say we think they're wrong. We think we disagree, but that's not the problem. There are, there, are, there are problematic forms of religion which are causing real harm in the world. And there are, and even, and there are problematic aspects of religion. You know, it's, it's more complicated than that. You know, I mean, um, <laughs> there are many church denominations under which there's a lot going on which is good and there are other things that are bad because they're covering things up etc etc um so i think i think just focusing on what's clearly and evidently bad and wrong is 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 the thing to do and you don't have to worry about the rest really do you, do you think that um something like the church of england does stop more extreme um sort of sex appearing like in the sense of um is that something that should be our lowest priority uh, and then you know other more dangerous forms we may be able to prioritize against or is it um... yeah i don't know i don't know i think it's a difficult one that i mean the, the, a lot of the arguments of the new atheists was that it's the other way around that these kind of more moderate forms of religion provide the cover for the extremists. So they basically make religion acceptable so that when the more extreme people come along, you, know, you can't be properly critical of them because, because they, they, they were supposed to respect religion. And uh, that, that, that's, I mean, you know, that, that can be a problem, which is, I think actually, you know, I would like to see these more moderate sensible forms of religion being a bit more critical of, of <coughs> extreme religion, you know, um, on the other hand, um, <sighs> Like I say, it seems at the time in which the dominant form of Christianity in this country was the Church of England, religion was really very tame, very moderate and not really problematic. And that um, you get more, more problems with the rest. So, I mean, it's the, that is an empirical question, I guess. And I, I, I don't really know what the answer is, I'm afraid, Gary. Um, you've done a superb job. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Thank you. Gary. Let's go to Sally. Sally next. Ah, yes, thank you, Julian. I thought that was a very interesting talk. Um, can I go back to what you were saying um, about um, Hume and the, the racist footnote, as it were? Um, could you tell us a little bit more about um, his 
his life in that respect. I, I mean, uh, we're in an age where there was slave trading on a huge mm. scale, you know, and companies, you know, people profiting from um, the slave trade to a great extent. Uh, um, on the other hand, we're getting abolitionists um, starting by the end of his life anyway. Um, you know, the abolition movement is coming in. Where did he stand that way? I mean, I mean yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, one of his defenders is a Scottish historian, Tom Devine, who says that, you know, within Hume's time and milieu, there just simply wasn't at that time a, a, a strong abolitionist movement yet. Um, there were a few people ahead of a curve, but it wasn't mainstream. And um, I mean, he, he did, he, he wasn't really active in these issues at all. He did write very clearly that slavery was terrible and was wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, some people think that he was really, his blindness there was he was talking about ancient Greek slavery and not the slavery of his time. But that doesn't seem to be true. He, he doesn't seem to be giving an argument against slavery full stop, no matter in whatever mm -hmm. age. On the other hand, there was also something which came out which some people thought was damning, which was that he encouraged a friend to make an investment in a plantation, which he must have known mm -hmm. was... Yeah. was being uh, worked by slaves. And that was the kind of thing whereby, uh, you know, a friend asked him if he would ask a friend if he would invest in the plantation, and he did. And I, I think, you know, so, so what, what we kind of see is this is something which wasn't really a big salient issue for him. And I, I think it's quite easy to see how that's... We, we can think of analogies of where there are huge social injustices which are pretty invisible to most people and to the extent they are aware of them they kind of think that it's i don't know that it, it's just one of those sad things that goes on and 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 maybe you know there's not much can be done about it i mean i think some of the analogy i might give you is in industrial agriculture animal agriculture right mm -hmm. i mean we've known for decades absolutely for decades how awful conditions are for certain factory farmed animals now mm -hmm. how do most people respond to that including decent people who give lots of money to charity most people actually do very very little about it and the number of mm -hmm. people who are like you know vegan is still as a proportion very small uh, we, we're being told that it's exploding but actually the number is still very very small and when you dig actually what those people eat actually most of them aren't pure vegan anyway um the number of vegetarians is larger but a lot of vegetarians aren't very discerning about where they get their dairy or and that's where some of the worst abuses of animals occur mm -hmm. in the dairy industry actually um in a way, you've got to look after your, your, your beef animal reasonably well, or you don't get good beef, whereas you can milk your cow till it's lame and you still get the milk. Um, so, you know, I mean, you can see an example there where you can, so you, I'll give this an example, not to say there's a direct comparison, but you can kind of see how the kind of psychology of it works. You live in a society, mm -hmm. these things are going on, they're so ubiquitous, but so in the background, and so taken to be natural facts of life. And the majority of people, they're just kind of oblivious to it. And hopefully at some point in the future, these things change and people look back and go, blimey, how could people have put up with that? And, and they did. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the sort of the slave trade was something going on that, you know, it wasn't in people's faces. They knew it was happening. It was in the background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people didn't really see how you're going to get um, sugar and stuff if you didn't do this. And, you know, uh, and they did probably, I'm sure they did. Most people made assumptions about, racial superiority and inferiority yeah. you know people yeah. thought well if they haven't got culture and civilization surely they're not the same as us and they look different don't they you know it's obviously to our modern eyes it's really really ignorant but actually i was writing about something like this recently about animal stuff when i was at school we we, we once a week we had the opportunity to do what they called social work which is basically doing a task for an old elderly person who couldn't do one and we used to go shopping for an old lady who's in her 80s i think um maybe older actually uh, she, was, she, she could barely see but she still lived independently she was and she was a lovely little old lady kind of thing and we went and bought her like two huge bags of all brand it seemed to be the only thing she ate and um she made us tea and biscuits and you know once she was saying you know oh i saw an interview the other day with um some some person some african chap and oh, do, do, do you know that you know when they're educated they're, they're just as intelligent as we are you know now this was a woman in the later part of the 20th century in the uk still expressing surprise that um yeah. you know someone in the black skin actually guess what is 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 is, is on the same level 
field as everybody else. If, if and that's with everything that's been happening around awareness around racism, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of easily imagine how people, you know, without that kind of challenge of things being in the forefront, remarkable. it's remarkable what could be taken for granted in a negative way. Yeah. So, so to yeah. conclude, I mean, sorry, I think, I think that, you know, if you look at, in the context of his time, um, Hume at the time would, would have certainly been seen as a, as a, as a moderate, a progressive, against certain things, but he wasn't ahead of his time at all on this. Mm -hmm. And, and that's kind of, dis it's disappointing with someone who you think is sharper than most people around him, that on this view, he wasn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and we can't, we can't really redeem him. We can, we can, we, we can, we can, we can, we can point out that he wasn't particularly awful and lots of decent people were just like this at the time. So let's not demonize him, but we, we, we can't find anything in his life to say, ah, oh, but actually look, look, you know, he, he was, he was, he was actually great. Really. You know, he may have said this, but he was campaigning against slavery. He wasn't. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Uh, Marjorie. Hello, thank you for the talk. It was most interesting. Um, I want to carry on slightly with this theme of sort of people absorbing their environment. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, Hume was, I assume, was brought up with a religious background, and then he thought about what he'd been taught. And I, I'm still wondering how much children are brought up with a religious background that they're perhaps taught from a very young age um, and whether we think that gradually as religion gets a less and less importance in the country or maybe we could argue about that um, whether you would think children might start with less religious baggage and, and where does, how can we unknit this sort of mixture of what you teach little children? I mean, the, we tell them about fairies, unicorns, angels, God. How can they sort out what's what? Um, probably eventually they do learn there aren't any unicorns, but um, perhaps we still believe in fairies, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, we've, 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 we've got this sort of emotional soup that I suppose we're born into and I just wonder how whether you think it might gradually dilute or just change or whether the children in the 21st century are going to be different from the children of the 20th century. Well, I mean, you asked me to be a futurologist, and I really, oh, really well. don't know. These, 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 these things are, are, are quite complicated, aren't they? They're you know, very, very complicated. And I think it seems to be the case that the general trend is, you know, as religion becomes less a part of education and parents, etc., that, you know, uh, generations get progressively um, less, less religious. Um, even the United States was a great outlier in the sort of secularization trend for quite a long time, but there were signs that even there now, um, rates of non-belief are growing quite, quite sharply. And um, particularly in the younger generation are at the forefront of that. But I just think it's so difficult to know, to sort of be able to anticipate all the different factors which, um, make certain beliefs more disposed to be believed if that's the right way of putting it in society than others so for example it was interesting that i saw some little survey the other day it was very oddly phrased um because it kind of suggested that religiosity had you know the, the pandemic had made people more inclined to believe in god and to get interested in in religion um but it but it, i think the, the way the question was posed it, it was almost like asking people whether it was their perception that other people had become more religious or something, <laughs> rather, than, rather than actually sort of discovering that people have become more religious. People were saying, well, it seems to me that this pandemic has increased religiosity, which is an odd kind of question to ask. But, you know, it's possible. It's possible. I mean, it, it wouldn't be too surprising if, you know, uh, as the sort of sense of existential risk had gone up, that it leads a lot of people who were kind of, you know, most, most people, I think you've got to remember as a humanist group, your people who have made, conscious and thought through decisions about what you believe on and it's, and it's sometimes surprising to remember that 
I think the vast majority of people actually never really even go through that process. They kind of have a set of beliefs which have kind of evolved and changed a bit. And, and then and they're vague and fuzzy and, and they're, people are no interest in making them any less vague and fuzzy. Perhaps because they fear it's going to push them in a direction they don't want to go. You know, they fear that if they, mm-hmm. if they give up their vague belief in God, then they're going to be left feeling that there's no hope. Or, or something and at the same time if they but if they think about it too that they neither do they want to have to get too religious because that seems a little bit bonkers so most people are happy to let sleeping dogs lie mm. so when sort of existential insecurity increases you can imagine that pushing a certain percentage of the population into kind of like you know uh grabbing a bit more tightly to those loosely held um things and so you know i think that we don't really know what's going to happen with history, and I suspect the historical forces will be um, probably, it's a guess, but are probably more important than anything to do with automatically what, what people do when they're more educated or have less religious children. Um, I, th- I believe, and someone may know doing it, th- I believe that the, if you're looking for the strongest correlation between, and, and even this is only a correlation, it's not direct, the, 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 the strongest correlation between any kind of one factor and levels of religiosity in a society, it seems to be uh, basically a kind of economic security. It's not wealth as such, it's security. So hence the Scandinavian nations where they got very, very strong social protection and you just, you're just not going to end up on the street unless something goes really, really terribly wrong. Levels of belief are, are, are very low. The United States is the richest country in the world, but you're only one paycheck away from Skid Row. And their religious belief has stayed quite high. And that seems to be the clearest correlation. So, you know, if we, if we, end, if we, come, if we get into a world where factors such as global warming, etc., massively increase people's sense of existential insecurity, we may well see a rise of uh, uh, an increase in religious belief again. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marjorie. Let's go to Paul. Uh, Julian, I thought it was an excellent talk, and thanks for not showing any slides. I, it was really <laughs> refreshing. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to ask about this cause and effect. Um, I'm surprised in a way that someone as smart as you has a problem with that. Just looking up a simple definition of cause, it says to make something happen. An effect is a change, which is a result or consequences of an action. So pricking your finger is a, is a cause and the effect is it hurts. Um, you can go into the details of the mechanism of how it is and, and all the neurons that have to work to make it do it. But I don't think you need that to have cause and effect. So I, I'm... Can you tell me why it's so hard to, for him or to, to just simply understand cause and effect? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting question because I suppose, you know, you're puzzled that you can't understand cause and effect. Well, there's a sense which he obviously understands cause and effect because he says there's a sense which everybody in the world understands cause and effect. You can't even begin to do anything in the world unless you understand cause and effect. So it's all about not understanding cause and effect. It's about what if you then go further and say, okay, but what are, on, on what basis do I know the cause and effect is actually going on? I mean, I, you know, I, I can give loads of examples. Yeah. How, what's my base, on what basis though, do I believe that cause and effect exists at all? And there seems to be only sort of two, two possibilities there. One is that, you know, you can demonstrate it as you would a mathematical proof, but that doesn't work because such things only tell you about concepts. So the other is that you, you must observe it. And Hugh's point is say, well, look, just look really, really carefully. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you, what do you observe? And um, what you observe is one thing and then another thing happening with, with what seems to be predictable regularity. But again, it's not just about, it's more than just a statistical thing because there are statistical correlations which are, uh, you know, one, one to one. Uh, where where that's not cause and effect, um, so uh, you know, if you, you know the 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 the, the, the um, I don't know the, um, a bell rings or something, and you know that that's that's correlated exactly with this the cycle of the the sun, but it's not the cycle, not the movement of the sun which is causing the bell to ring. It's just that they've it, it's something independently causing 
both things. And so, so here's Paul. Like, it, it, it's a good question to ask, though, because a lot of people find this puzzling. You know, what, what exactly is the problem here? What is the puzzle? And, and it's hard to sort of, it's surprisingly hard perhaps to, to sort of grasp that there is a puzzle, that you don't, you, you don't observe the cause and effect. You, just, you never do. And that's the whole point. Now, we're so used to thinking we do that it seems, well, of, of course we do. But, but we don't then actually. Say it's a correlate. You could just say it's correlation, but it, it's, if you do it a hundred times and, and, or a thousand yeah. times, you prick your finger and it hurts every time, there must be a, a direct relationship. I, I, I don't know, maybe the language cause and effect is a problem, but I, 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 yeah. I'm still struggling to... Well, well, the, well there must, 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 must be is kind of... Is, is, <laughs> that's the way we feel. But from a logical point of view, there's no must be about it, you know. From a logical point of view, something can happen a thousand times in a row doesn't mean it's going to happen the thousand first time, right? So it's not so it's not must in that strong logical. Yeah, but, yeah, but if you if you then have a model which you can predict it will happen, mm. but it must have cause and effect built into it because otherwise you couldn't predict. So oh, yeah, of course. I mean, the, whole yeah, yeah. Of sci- the whole of science falls apart if you can't if you can't have cause and effect. Oh well, no, I agree. Now, and Hume agrees with all that. So the point is this: I think it's very clear to understand he's not questioning the existence of cause and effect his, his, his puzzle is about what is the fundamental justification of that belief and he's saying it's neither logic nor observation it's something else now that, i'll come to another point in, in a second about this which i think is um um potentially interesting um there is a there is a, a mode of argument which uh, hume didn't explicitly follow but um it was it was really thought about more later by the american pragmatists because the problem Hume had was is a version of a big problem in philosophy in general called the problem of induction. The problem of induction is that all our beliefs about the way the world works are based upon the observation of what has happened to date. But there's a kind of a, a, the logical problem is that X has happened to date, as it were, never means X will continue to happen. A, a statement about the future is, is not logically necessitated by any number of statements about the past. So you've got this fundamental problem that, of course, we do, and we're not rejecting the method. We generalise from experience. But when we generalise from experience, we're doing something from a logical point of view we're not entitled to. We're con- making conclusions about one class of experience on the basis of others. And it's a big, big problem in, 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 in philosophy. Now, there is this sort of... Um, so that's one of induction. Now, abduction is, is this idea that what you do is, uh, you, 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 it's, it's arguments what's called arguments the best explanation. So when, when you're saying what is the best explanation of something, that's something kind of weaker than, um, it, it, it could, in a sense, it's weaker than saying that the evidence conclusively shows this is the case. And I think in the case of cause and effect, you know, in a way, you could say Hume, Hume was fussing about something he didn't have to fuss about because, you know, there are, if we think, well, there's, there's regularity in the world. And what is the best explanation of that? You could say, well, look, the only, the only credible explanation of that is that there is some kind of necessary connection between these, underlying these regularities. That gives you your rational justification for... Um, for uh, cause and effect. And I think something like that has, has got to be true. But I think the, the thing to recognize right, is not that uh, therefore he missed something obvious, he didn't. It's just that that kind of argument, well, there's no better explanation, it's the best one available. Um, by the kind of philosophical standards of his time and in history it would have been sort of very, very weak indeed. People thought that, you know, I mean, most, a lot of people follow people like Descartes and everyone who believe that, you should be able to provide a, a, a logically secure basis for your beliefs. And the alternative to that was the empirical thing, was that everything is based entirely on observations and experience. Whereas this idea that, no, sometimes you just have to go for, well, what's the best explanation amongst the competing ones? And, and that, that's the one you stick with. It is a kind of a, a weaker standard of justification, which, um, you know, if we've learned to become comfortable with that, that's good. But uh, I think people were not comfortable with it at the time. It didn't seem good enough. And people, a lot of people don't think it sounds good enough even today. Okay, great. Um, we're, we're just about out of time. We try to wrap up at uh, half past three. Um, Susan Bryson, you did put your blue hand up um, a little bit earlier. Just raise your hand if you've still got a question, but if not, 
You still have a question, Susan. Okay, well, that's fine. If you'd like to unmute yourself, could you just unmute your screen? And then we'll make that, I think, probably the last question. And we'll let, uh, let Julian go. Can you unmute her, by the way, because she seems to have trouble unmuting herself. Um, I think uh, Sue, I think Kathy is trying to. Hopefully they'll... I don't think I can do it from here. All uh, right. I thought the host can unmute someone. Uh, you pick on the click on the three buttons in the corner of her screen. Do you not get an option to unmute? It just says ask to unmute. Ah, there you go. Um, oh well. It doesn't give me the power for some reason. Ah. Uh, I thought the Zoom hosts were omnipotent. Yeah, <laughs> I, I should, it should be really. Yeah. Yeah. Um. They, they do it that way in case someone chooses to mute themselves for privacy reasons. Ah, there we go. Quite sure where. Let me just start. I'm, I'm, if we, Julian, are you okay for a few more minutes? Yeah, let's let's make that the last question if we if we can get it. Um, yeah, we're muted. Oh, here we go. Great, Susan. Go ahead. After all that, you're going to be expecting something wonderful. <laughs> yes, yes, I'd be expecting something wonderful. Hit me with it, Susan. <laughs> all I was going to say to Julian was, it was such a lovely talk. I loved it. And to say that I could have read a book just as well isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> that's very nice that's, 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 I like that I could not have planted a better uh, uh, final question to my talk, but I assure you I didn't but the check is in the post Susan thank you like, uh, <laughs> any questions a trivial one at the end but it's not trivial and also I'm going to read some Hume so you've inspired me <laughs> thank you I'm glad you're not reading it out. I thought you were going to start reading it out. <laughs> but, um, let me, Julian. Let me give. Uh, let me give a plug to your book. Uh, Julian's new book is called *The Great Guide: What David Hume Can Teach Us About Being Human and Living Well*. So that's the book. Uh, oh, it's not going to show up on my screen, but anyway, uh, it's out now from uh, all booksellers. Julian, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real delight, and uh, it's been lovely to have the uh, Q&A with you as well. Um, yeah. Thanks so, for coming, everyone. And uh, I'm sure you can catch the end of the Wimbledon final, unless it was a very quick one, in which case it wasn't worth, wasn't a shame you missed it. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> do. OK, we'll see you again, Julian. Take care. I hope so. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Okay, bye. 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 bye.